Welcome to part two of the Australian Biocommons PAUSI Supercomputing Centre webinar series using containers in bioinformatics. In this session, we'll take the next step into customising your containers. I'm Christina Hall from the Australian Biocommons and co-hosting we have Anne Backhouse from PAUSI who will moderate questions today. We hope you find today's session uh, engaging and we look forward to hearing your questions throughout. Our speaker will address the questions at various stages throughout the webinar and the way to ask questions is via an online discussion board at tinyurl.com forward slash custom dash containers. Please open this document now if you haven't already and start your conversation. This document is for comments and questions. Feel free to address other people's questions if you know the answers to them. This is a collaborative document and we have a couple of containers experts there to help us. Audrey Stott and Alexis Espinosa from Palsy have generously offered to assist on the discussion board today. Questions put to the speaker throughout the webinar will come from this document, so please don't use Zoom's Q&A or chat function. This document will stay live after the event finishes for your future reference. You can also look back at the recordings of this session as they'll be available soon via the Australian Biocommons YouTube channel as well as the Pause Your YouTube channel. We'll let you know by email uh, when they're available. So once again, we have Pause Supercomputing Centre's Marco De La Pierre. He's a supercomputing specialist who works with researchers on challenges that include the design and deployment of containers for high performance computing. Marco is an experienced trainer, so we're thrilled he's here to bring you customizing your containers. Welcome everyone to this second webinar in this series on, on containers for bioinformatics and HPC and cloud. Um, so this is the second webinar in this in the series. Uh, yesterday, um, the introductory one, we covered uh, some basic topics, including uh, what are containers and why we're using them, uh, how to use Singularity to download and run uh, containers and execute commands inside them, how to share file between uh, host machine and the containers, and, uh, and then we, we got a very first uh, broad view of how to build a container image with, singul with Singularity. Uh, so today we're going to build on top of that, and. Uh, First thing, we're going to go into more detail um, about how to, what are the main components of a recipe file to build a container. So what are the main components of a definition file for Singularity? Uh, then we're going to move on and discuss how you could use Docker to build container images and why you should consider building images with Docker compared to Singularity. And then the, th the th uh, third session today will be about uh, uh, graphical applications um, that can be run from containers. And uh, we're going to see an example of a web application, um, quite popular one, uh, that uh, we will be able to spawn using containers. So let's get started. So yesterday, we, I left you with the uh, graphical of a literate cow able to cite Mark Twain and other uh, novelists. So let's start from there. Uh, some key take home messages about building container images uh, are here in the slides. So we need some form of recipe that describes what commands to execute to build a container. So this is how you get some software installed inside the container for future usage. Um, after that, there is a step, the actual step of building the containers, and this is done. Uh, by using Singularity with uh, sudo privileges. And once the image is built, uh, you can then use it with uh, the typical execution commands. And eventually you can share it uh, either on public registries using Singularity push, or uh, as Singularity images are simple files, uh, just big ones, you might use typical file transfer utilities to share the image. Uh, with your peers or across different machines you're using. So this is kind of the broad um, process. Now we're gonna dive a bit more in detail into the definition file for a singularity image. So let's go back to uh, my terminal window, which is still open on a cloud uh, virtual machine on, our, on the POSI cloud, uh, the Nimbus cloud. And this is where we were yesterday. So 
we were built the lolcow.sif container by using the lolcow.dev definition file. So let's have a look at the content of this file um, and try and comment on what are the, the main sections and the, and the key uh, syntax that you need to, to know if you want to write one from scratch. Um, so you might see here and there, there are some typical Linux command, uh, not many in this definition file because it was kind of a simple one. So you, you can see here a couple of uh, Ubuntu Debian commands just to install software. And that's how we got, we got basically the cow working by means of these three packages. But this is the typical Linux syntax, right? And then we, we have another Linux syntax, which is uh, uh, setting uh, an environment variable for, for uh, the installed packages to work as they should. Uh, what we want to focus now is on the additional syntax we need uh, on the set of singularity for our definition file to be um, formatted properly. So the first and, and key piece of information is the starting image we, we want to use to build our container image. Um, and we need to specify two informations here. So one is the web registry where we are picking the image from. So we do that using bootstrap followed by the, the, the type of uh, web registry. In this case, it's Docker. So we're picking the image from uh, Docker Hub. And then which image, which base image we're actually using from the, the web registry. And in this case, it was a uh, Ubuntu uh, tag 18.04. So that's a starting point for any build. You need to, to start from some pre-existing image. And I'm gonna show you later a slide where I'm just giving some suggestions. So based on, on the type of application you want to containerize, you might want to start from different images just to make your life easier. Um, then you see here is where we have the Linux commands that we're actually executing to install applications uh, in the image. And in a, the singularity definition file, you put these commands in a section that needs to be started with the label percent post. So this is where you put all of the uh, Linux commands in this recipe. Then we have the part where we are defining environment variables and those need to go under the percent environment section in a definition file. And I would say these three bits, so the starting image, the Linux commands, and the environment definitions, these are the three key components that you need in an image. If you know to, how to basically write these three bits, you're halfway into uh, building a container image. Uh, provided that you already know uh, the list of Linux commands that you need to install your software. And then we can have, uh, so in this, in this specific uh, file, we have additional uh, sections in the definition file. So we have a label section, which is basically a place where you can uh, add information, metadata to your image, and that can be useful for, not for you, but for other people using the image, in knowing, for instance, uh, with the author of the, of the image, and eventually a version. You could put anything here in the form of a key and a value. So it's kind of free, free text format under this labels um, section. Interestingly, you can uh, get this information from the final image by means of the command singularity inspect. So if you do singularity inspect and then the image file name, you get uh, a number of uh, strings including the two that were defined in the definition file under the labels section. Uh, let us just go back in uh, here. So then there is a help section which, uh, where you can provide uh, a quick help text that will be uh, displayed when you run singularity run help and the image name. Uh, this is possibly not always useful. Maybe if you have a, a more complex container with a, where the application needs some um, documentation of the usage, that might be a good place where you want to put that information. Um, and then there is another, another uh, section called run script, and I'm going to comment on this uh, soon. Let me just uh, add a couple of comments from the slides. So on the key parts of the definition file, I mentioned three already. So the base image with bootstrap and from, the Linux commands with post, and the shell variables with environment. There is a fourth one you might want to know in terms of key components, which was not used in this example, uh, but 
you might often need. It's uh, the file section, and here you would put a list of files that you might need to copy from the host machine uh, into the container image that is being built. And examples of this might be, say, configuration files uh, that you need to customize prior to building the container. So it might be just easier to have a, a copy ready in the host and just copy it in. Or uh, there might be other cases of this type uh, where, you, where you really want to, to just copy files in rather than building uh, or downloading files from the internet in the host section of Linux domain. Um, I've already touched on this. Let me just add a couple of comments. So one handy feature of Singularity is that with Singularity Inspect, you mm, not only you get uh, the labels that you mm, documented in the definition files, you can also get the output of the full definition files itself. And you can achieve that with Singularity Inspect minus D for definition file, and then the name of the container. And this is quite handy as well. And then back to the last section of the definition file, this run script. So uh, honestly, I, I don't uh, recommend the usage of this one uh, that much. Um, and that's because what you get here, you get a default command. You get to choose one default command that Singularity can execute in your container with a simplified syntax. Um, and you can actually get this just by running the image file as an executable. To do that, you get the result of that command. And so it's here because it's nice to have a, just a single, a very simple command to make the cow speaking. But other than that, I wouldn't recommend that for scientific applications just because very often you have multiple commands to be executed from the same package, same blast, you might have blast m, blast p, and so on. And here you need to pick one for this special syntax. The other commands will still need to be run in the canonical way, singularity exec and so on. And actually also similar way, you might, have, uh, you might even have a few packages that only have one single command, so you might use them this way. But then I'm pretty, I'm, um, I'm, I can tell you that in uh, all user cases I know, people always have in the software stack at least one or two packages which have multiple commands. And then uh, this means that in, in the way they get used to using containers, they will, they will need to keep in mind both ways of running the simplified one and the full one. And so my take is, okay, guys, just keep on using the, the canonical way, singularity exec, and then still just forget about the run script apart from this tutorial uh, for the call of the cow. Um, one last uh, little comment on uh, useful definition file sections. There is a start script section, and uh, this can be used when you need to define commands for uh, spawning long running services from uh, with singularity so say you need to run a a long standing r studio or jupyter session from a, from a container then the syntax is a bit different from what we've seen so far and you will need to populate a start script section in the definition file uh, in the interest of time we're not going through this uh, specific example in detail but this example is covered in the tutorial materials that are available online and uh, for which I will put uh, the link back on screen at the end of this presentation uh, for those of you that are interested. Uh, just one last word, uh, we mentioned the, the, the usage of base images, which is the starting point for uh, building uh, any container. Uh, you, must, you might just want to take note or think about these specific user cases. So we, we use Ubuntu there for base image, but there are other nice ones. So for Python, you have uh, Python images that could be useful. If you are a Conda fan and user, uh, Continuum.io, which is the company behind uh, Anaconda, provides interesting containers that ship with, with Conda. If you use Jupyter notebooks a lot, there are Jupyter images that might be a good starting point. If you are a R user, um, there is the Rocker project, which is a, which have done a, a great amount of work in providing R and R Studio images that might be the starting point for uh, R-based containers. And then uh, for um, HPC intensive users, uh, NVIDIA provides uh, CUDA-based images for GPU applications. 
And uh, POSI provides uh, ready to use MPI images for parallel applications for usage on POSI systems. I think it's a good time to stop and take a couple of uh, first questions uh, okay. from today's audience. That sounds good. Thank you, Marco. Um, there is a bit of dialogue going on around the installation of Singularity yeah. and where you need to install it in the system when you want to use it. Okay. Um, and so just if you have some hints or tips. Yeah, so that. in the, let me quickly show you. Um, I'm just looking for my web browser here. Okay. So if you are on a shared system, you can't install Singularity because that requires uh, administrative privileges. But you can install Singularity, say, on a cloud instance that you're using or on your personal machine, provided you have uh, administrative privileges. Um, I'm not entering into full details here, but uh, again, um, if you follow then the link that we give you at the end of the webinar uh, for the tutorial materials, there is a setup page there. Um, and here I'm providing installation script for a number of tools, including Singularity. There is also Docker that we <laughs> will come handy quite soon. Uh, this is quite straightforward for any Linux box. So you basically download the script. If it is a Ubuntu machine, chances are it will work. <laughs> Otherwise, just take it as a template. You might need to edit it a bit, but that's a good starting point. It installs the required dependencies and then run the building of the Singularity and some configuration. If you're on Mac or Windows, uh, the best way to install Singularity is via uh, a virtual machine engine called the background. But again, you need the privileges, the root privileges to install it. But once it's there, it's beautiful because you can just spawn a Linux box from there and use the same instructions that I'm providing here. And if this is not enough, so I've recently added a, an episode in this tutorial material, which, is, which goes into further detail uh, on how to install Singularity on your machine. And then you can go back to this page and scroll down, have a look, and hopefully uh, it will guide you in the process. Yeah. Okay, that was the biggest discussion point. There were some other comments about um, writing comments. Do you use a hashtag? Or how do you write a comment within a Singularity depth file? Ah, good point, yeah, I, I, I never, uh, I never done it, uh, and you will uh, get the reason in a couple of minutes. But I believe that you, you should be able to use the typical bash uh, hash uh, to, to turn a line into a comment line. Yeah, good. So, yeah, I'm not going into further detail into singularity definition file, and there's a reason for that. Uh, so I spent, yeah, last 10 minutes and possibly 20 minutes yesterday in showing you how to build images with singularity. I'm gonna tell you, no, don't build images with Singularity, please. It's, <laughs> it's, it's better if you use Docker. And uh, so, um, let's get this one right. So, before you yell at me, let's just run this command on my Linux uh, terminal. Um, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll expand on, on the point I've just made. So let's move into directory, which is containing another definition file called a Docker file. Um, and ask Docker this time to build a container image called, I don't know, local, and then dot, which stays for the current directory. This will start a build process using Docker this time. You can see we need sudo again because similar to Singularity, any build process, actually a build process for most container engines these days requires sudo uh, privileges. But why am I telling you, okay, ditch, uh, forget about singularity for building and go for Docker? Um, ultimately, it's up to you. Now, here I'm just giving you some uh, elements to assess the two and pick the one you prefer. Remember that for building images with singularity, you need any way to be outside the HPC shared system because you can't run sudo on an HPC system. So you would, you would need a, a singularity installation, again, on your laptop or on a cloud instance on your office workstation. But at that point, if you have sudo access to install Singularity, it comes quite uh, straightforward to install Docker as well. So this doesn't complicate the, your, install, your setup that much. Um, so Singularity has some advantages. Uh, the native image format is a single file. So it's very 
is basically um, trivial to share it with anyone because it's just a file. Um, you can define in the definition file distinct usage modes, um, and you got you got an idea of that. So you you can uh, so the normal usage is with exec, um, but then you can um, define um, default commands with run, and most importantly, you can very unambiguously define uh, the commands that you want to run to spawn long running services with start script. And uh, this is what this, what this instance mention means. Um, whereas on, on these points, Docker is a bit, uh, a bit less clear. You, you can often get confused. Uh, you might ask yourself, okay, what do I need to do with this image? And how do I set it up? So that's a bit more blurred in Docker. Um, Singularity has some quite powerful ways to set up the shared environment in the definition file. I didn't cover all of that in uh, the previous presentation, but it has some interesting syntax. And also Singularity has a lot of uh, stress on the security and signing of container images. And this partly goes back to the discussion you know, we had yesterday. So you might uh, want to find ways to ensure that the image you ship is actually the one that was created. So you want to be ensured that uh, you know what you installed in the image and the image you're running is actually the one containing those files and not an image that has been corrupted by hackers or whatever. So Singularity has got some good facilities there. Uh, so what's on the Docker side? Um, so first, the second point, uh, Docker is a multiple file format. So you don't have a single file, you have a layered image, which is breaking down in chunks in your file system. So it's a bit more complicated to, to move around, but this caching of, uh, so this uh, la layering of the, of the image allows caching during the build process. So it can be quite uh, useful for uh, when you're testing the, the build of your uh, application in the container. Um, but honestly, you could live without that. The, the big point is actually the first one, compatibility. Um, so a singularity, a singularity image can only be run by singularity, whereas a Docker image can be run by any container engine. And, uh, and this is quite important because it's not up entirely to you to decide what is the engine in a, in a shared system, right? Uh, you will never get Docker in, a, in an HPC site, but you might get other container runtimes that only read Docker images. Um, or you might ship your uh, and share your image with uh, collaborators that are unable to use singularity. So Docker, ensure, Docker images ensure this type of compatibility with any container engine. Uh, and this, uh, and uh, the other point here is also that you, if you want to share images with Docker, you have this uh, place called Docker Hub, or you have uh, t.io for bioinformatics, and both these registries uh, assume and use Docker image format. So when you build images with Docker, you are becoming part of this huge community of container image uh, creators uh, and users. Um, and that alone is a huge point for building images with Docker. Um, because the bottom line is, depending on which one you use for building, you need to learn a different syntax for the definition file or, or Docker file. Um, so what happened to me, for instance, I, I started with Docker. Uh, I learned the syntax very well. Then Singularity came out. I, I kind of learned the syntax that I just showed you for definition files, but then it was like, okay, I don't want to uh, keep on using two languages. And they just uh, remained with Docker because it was so much popular compared to Singularity. Um, but hold with me. So it's not as bad as it sounds because I, I believe I, I presented you uh, the build process with singularity and uh, the structure of the definition file in a quite general way. So it will be quite straightforward for you right now to get what are the differences that you, you need to pick to, to use Docker for building. So we, we mentioned with singularity definition files that you have uh, four key uh, sections to keep in mind, starting image, Linux commands, shell variables and copying files if you wish to. Uh, and here I'm providing you the, the, the corresponding syntax in Docker. So you specify starting image with the from directive, you execute Linux command with run, define shell variables with env, and copy files with add or copy. Uh, and that's basically what you all, all, all you need to know for writing a, a Docker file, so a definition file for Docker. And then I'm going to show you the example uh, in a couple of minutes. I'm just letting the build. 
uh, to finish in my terminal. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And um, this is one point. One other important point that you're going to see soon in the Docker file. Uh, so you saw in the singularity definition file with sections, post, environment, so, and so on. The, uh, the syntax I just showed you for, for Docker, such as RAN, are more like uh, directives to be prepended to each command. So you won't have a single run section, but rather uh, each Linux command to be run will start with run. Um, so you will basically will see in a longer Docker files multiple appearances of run, of, of hand, and so on, because these are more like keywords, they're not section headers. Uh, and then just uh, relating back to what I mentioned, uh, the fact that uh, Docker images are structured in layers. Uh, the thing is each instruction in uh, the Docker file maps to one layer. And so that's how you know how many layers you have in a Docker file, for instance. Now, hopefully, okay, I, I've talked enough, long enough, so the build has finished. <laughs> um, so you see the last line say successfully built and the string and successfully tagged lolcow today. Um, so let me show you the Docker file. So which, where hopefully you can find the hints of what I just showed in the slide. So first line, you see the from directive to define the Ubuntu 18.04 container that we're using as, as the base image. Um, then we're using the label uh, directive to define uh, an author and a version label similar to what we did in the singularity image. And then here we're using the run um, directive to execute the Linux commands. Uh, here I could have used two, one for the first apt get and one for the second one. Uh, for whatever reason, I decided to just concatenate them in a, in a single go but the key point is use run to execute linux commands and then here and u is used to define an environment variable path in this case uh, and okay very last thing uh, if you are uh, if you really want to have a default command uh, uh, so the matching of run script in singularity is cmd in, in docker mm. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, the Docker file, so the definition file for Docker images with build the image. Now, I, in this context, I want to keep the usage of Docker really just confined to the build process. So the next thing I'm gonna show you is how to convert the Docker image into Singularity One, because soon after we are done with the building with Docker, we have achieved the, this point of having a um, universally compatible Docker image. Now we want to know how to share it and how to use it with Singularity. So let me go back to the slides. Uh, so we, we saw how to build with Docker, we saw the Docker build and the image name and tag with minus T and just specifying where the Docker file sits, current directory. No. Um, and then, okay, this, the next command is the one that allows you to basically convert the Docker image into, in the, into a Singularity one. So as far as you have both Singularity and Docker installed in your build machine, you can achieve that. So Singularity tool, uh, uh, yes, and then uh, you're gonna name your Singularity image. And then we are gonna tell Singularity where to look for the image to pull. And it won't be Docker as we did yesterday because that would point to an online registry. It will be Docker daemon, which instead points to the local Docker installation. And I believe I've called the image local today. Uh, yes, this is just a, a little bug in the current Singularity installation. With Docker daemon, you, you have to skip the two slashes. All right, so the, and this will basically just convert the Docker image into the Singularity one. Um, and soon, this one, this one was small, so it will just take a couple of minutes. And when we're done, we have our Singularity image that you can use. And that's it. 
So the only difference is that we built the image with Docker. So you know the syntax now, Docker build. You saw, you get a very introductive view on the key Docker directives to put in a Docker file. Uh, and that's it, we're back to singularity. The very last thing you might need to do with Docker is that if you want to make the image available in a public registry, you will use Docker push to upload your image to say Docker Hub or key.io or wherever. You will need a free account to do that uh, and then you will be good to go. And that's it for building images with uh, Docker. Okay, we have a very interesting question. Um, is there a technical reason of why studio or root privileges are needed for building with Singularity and with Docker? A technical reason. Yeah, so I, I know, so basically this comes uh, down to how these container runtimes are implemented and how they work. So for Singularity, it's, uh, it's quite neat. Basically, you need sudo to run Singularity build uh, because the privileges that you, you will have in the build context inside Singularity will be the same that you have in, in the machine you are running the commands from. So if you need, so often, let me show you, um, let me just show you the definition file. So any package manager from uh, Linux install um, flavor, such as apt-get from Ubuntu, this will need sudo, it won't work without. Um, so uh, you need sudo to execute this during the build. And uh, the only way to achieve this with singularity is to run singularity build with sudo. Because basically with singularity, the user and privileges you get inside the, the container and inside the build context are the same that you get outside. So if you need sudo inside, you, you must run singularity build with sudo from the outside. And more at, lower, uh, at low level, it means there is a bunch, there is a bunch of uh, operations that singularity needs to perform that require uh, elevated privileges. And as regards Docker, uh, I, I don't have a, a similar detailed breakdown, but it, uh, in the end, it boils down to similar concepts. So there are portions that, uh, actually there are commands that need to be executed for the build and need sudo, and so you need sudo uh, for Docker. But Docker actually is a bit, um, is a bit even, um, needs even more from you because any Docker command, not only Docker build, needs to do, and that's because of the way the, the developers implemented things in Docker. So there is a, even just to spawn, to launch a container, Docker will need to do, and that's because it needs to interact with some part of, of your machine uh, that requires to do privileges. Um, and if you remember, so from the introduction yesterday, that's why people came out with a solution such as singularity, so that at least for running containers, you don't need um, the user to have elevated privileges. Um, but ultimately, there is a number of, of uh, aspects in uh, using containers that actually require this type of privileges. Okay, thanks. Um, there's some, some tips being shared mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. how to keep singularity images small or Docker images yep. for that matter. Um, do you have any tips yourself? Yes, so, uh, yes, so we, um, some of these might be documented a bit more in the tutorial. I, I will just mention one that is quite key that is not implemented here just because this is a, a toy Docker file, but the key one is, for instance, to clean up your build process. So say if you use apt-get, you should have an apt clean at the end of this and then if you look for best practices docker files um, and they will see there is one in the tutorial materials if you have a, if you have a look at those you see that for, for apt you are, you can also manually remove files in, in given temporary locations and that will save some space with conda you want to do conda clean if you are compiling the tool yourself you want to then say with configure make make install after you have installed the executables in a given location, you want to wipe the source code, so to save space. But then the, uh, this is not enough. So say you add apt clean, 
you need to, to do that within the same run directive. Uh, so within the same layer in the image. And that's why, uh, and that's, sorry, that's because when Docker builds the image, it does it in stages, in layers, uh, and Docker keeps track and snapshot of each layer in the final image. So if you say, um, get some temporary files with apt-get to install these packages in a, in, a, in a run command, and then you use another run command to delete those temporary files, those will still be in the, in the final image because Docker needs to cache a snapshot all of the single layers inside the image. That, that's by design, that's what allows the caching uh, of, uh, of, the, of the build process. So if you want to really save space, you need to add apt clean at the end, and this needs to be all within the same run, all within the same layer. This way, Docker will save in the image just the end result. So the installed packages without the temporary files that you actually clean. And, uh, and that's it. So that this is possibly one of the, um, so the most common and easy tip to implement in Docker files to reduce the image size. There are more elaborated ones, uh, which will take possibly a dedicated webinar. <laughs> so I'm not entering into, <laughs> into detail today. Um, and I think, I believe I need to move to the next, um, to the next, uh, a section of the of the webinar so um i hope you will have the the chance to keep on the conversation within the network of, of folks that are attending today um so now we are moving um our attention to a slightly different topic so we're done with building for today i've shown you enough ways of building containers uh, what I would like to show you is, um, is an example of how you can uh, run graphical applications uh, from, a dog, from a container. And I'm picking up the case of our studio because I believe, especially for this audience, it can be quite, in, uh, quite of interest, quite attractive. So you have, uh, say you have your R workflows and uh, you might need to run them both from command line and from a graphical interface. And you would love your workflows to be reproducible, so you have the same versions of the same dependencies for your workflow across these different uh, environments that you're using to run, say from command line or from graphical. Um, and here, containers can come handy. So you might use one of these RStudio enabled containers, and here I'm picking one from these Rocker developers I mentioned earlier today. Uh, so here you have the R packages embedded in the container. You have uh, R Studio inside the container. You also have Tidyverse, which some of you might know is a set of data science and data analytics packages in R. So this container is quite interesting because it packs all of this all together. And so we're gonna see how we can uh, get a working setup in, with containers and singularity to actually run a, a web session of R Studio from a container. Um, and I'm doing this in kind of a trial and error way because actually this is the way that I had to follow to learn how to how to have this working. So I hope you can get some uh, learning outcome just by seeing how the whole process looks like. And some of the things that I'm showing today that will take a minute to show took me hours, if not days, to figure out. Um, so the starting point was the one of the pages in the Rocker project page where they showcase their containers for R and they even have a page for users with singularity. So there was one thing that they mentioned is, okay, this is the command to run from command line to launch a R Studio server. So R server, then you need to specify a communication port, which can be any number. This is just 87, 87 is just a common one for R Studio. You need this because you will be launching our studio from a terminal and then you will access our studio from a web browser so you need you need a, a communication port which allows uh, the um, web browser to find uh, the the container or the actually the r server and communicate with it um, this is required if you this uh, specification of address being quadruple zero is required if you're running this say from a cloud instance and you need to access from your local browser. So, but it, but it doesn't hurt too much to have it always, so it can be there. And these other couple of uh, flags are required just to specify the authentic, authentication mode in our studio. So you want the server to be protected with a password and so you need those two flags. 
So this is where I started, and then I, I'm going to show you how to embed this command with uh, singularity, the typical singularity syntax you have seen before, so singularity exec, and so on. So let me go back to the terminal now. Um, just save the, the name of the rocker container I'm going to use. This is how we started basically. It was, and I apologize, I need one more piece of information, which is the full syntax I just showed you in the slide. So, our server with those four flags. This was just taken from the uh, container project rocker web page. So, let's, let's go as we went, uh, say yesterday with Blast and so on. So, singularity exec, the Docker image, and then the command. And then we get, we get this hanging screen, which is not too bad for something that you expect to be a, a long running service. So it means it, it didn't die badly. There was no error, it's just running. Uh, it is just a bit disturbing that you run something and you get no feedback at all of what's going on. This is uh, unfortunately a feature of the uh, RStudio server setup from command line. We need to live with that. So what we're gonna do now is to try and connect to this R server from my web browser. Uh, so what I need here is the IP address of the machine where I am uh, running this R Studio from, so my Nimbus cloud instance. And hopefully I, I have that in the history of the browser. No, it should be 140. Then you see that after the IP address, um, we have a colon and then the same port that I specified in the, in the command line. So that's promising. We are, we are getting a, a welcome screen saying R Studio. So, okay, not too bad. But then now the first trouble starts. So we have to specify username and password. And I can tell you the username of my Ubuntu, sorry, cloud instance is Ubuntu. But then I'm a bit, I'm a bit lost here because actually, first of all, uh, my Ubuntu VM doesn't have a password because I'm using SSH keys to log in. So I don't even know what to put in here. Uh, okay, so we need, I can try, I can, right, I can spend the, the whole rest of this webinar with random strings, but it's not really a clever idea. So I, we need to specify some credentials for access to this uh, server. So let's go back to the command line. And basically, again, if you start and dig in the instructions and documentation for our studio, which are not really detailed, to be honest, then you find out that you can uh, sort this out by defining some environment variables. So one called user and one called, called password, all in capital letters. Um, and we're going to do that with some singularity syntax that we saw yesterday. So even if by default singularity would pick uh, a variable called user or password, we're going this way because it's more robust. Uh, we might need to isolate, to elevate the level of isolation of this container, and we're going to do that later. So it's just best, best to use this uh, singularity specific syntax, which says, okay, you add singularity env underscore to a variable, and that variable will be carried over when you launch your container. So let's do this. Let's define our user, and let's define our password. Um, okay, of course, if you do this for production, you will need to possibly create a, a, a safer one, a stronger one. Um, and let's try again. So let's launch the, the server again from the comma line and refresh the page. And let's try again. So now I'm going to put the username I just defined in the, in the environment and, and the password. Oh, and here yeah, something is happening. So we got the credentials right, but we got something else wrong. Uh, and this very bit it kind of took me a bit of time to figure out when I was setting this up. Um, well, you might remember from what we said yesterday in the first webinar that uh, 
Singularity containers are read-only, so there's no way for applications to write anything in the container if they need to. And this is not a problem for a lot of applications, such as, uh, say, ones that you use for data analysis right away, single binaries such as Blast N, Blast P, same tools, whatever. But when you start and run more complex environments, such as a web server, well, these uh, applications normally need to write some configuration file as they, as they run. And that's what's happening here. Our studio is trying to write something in, a, in the home directory of, uh, of its file system, but is, is unable to. And it's unfortunate that, as I told you before, uh, there's no hint of that. <laughs> so you, you get the error in the, in the web server and you get nothing here. So that's why it took me a while to figure that out. And so what we need to do here, so I've, now I've killed the, the server once more, what we need to do here is to provide, to bind mount some directory that can act as the home for this container. In this way, we are getting the read write that we need. And that's basically similar to what we saw yesterday for Blast. Huh? Right? We bind mounted directories to make input files available and also to be able to write output files there. So now we're doing a similar thing just to provide some space where our studio can write things. So, as I said, the problem lies in the home, but we don't want to bind mount the home of our machine, not to expose any sensible files and data, SSH keys and so on. So we're going to do something different. We're going to bind mount with minus P, the current directory where uh, we're running from and call it, sorry, and call it home inside the container. And you might remember, we saw this yesterday, the default binding syntax is just specifying a directory and it will have the same name in the container. This is a bit uh, less frequent. You don't need to use this often, but this is the, the a good case. So you want to use a directory with a given name in the machine, but it has to have a different name in the container. And you see that here I'm putting home R Studio and not home Ubuntu. And again, this is a little technicality due to the way the rocker guys develop this image. Uh, it's a bit tedious, but it needs to be this way. Uh, and actually then I, I was happy with syntax. Then I found out that when running on different machines, it was breaking again. And so I figured out that the best way to have this working is actually to mount the directory twice. And the second time you call it with the same name that it has in the, in the host machine. This looks crazy and confusing. Um, if we have time, we can, I can get back in the question time on this. Otherwise, this specific syntax is discussed a bit in the tutorial materials uh, to relate to this uh, session today. What I'm doing, I'm just mounting the, the home, the same directory with two different names um, to make it work with this container. Uh, let's go. So, Let's uh, go back to the welcome page. Oh, so it picked the credentials that I had already entered before. Let me do it just from start. Uh, so let me log out. So I'm putting the credential in and I'm putting the password. And now I'm in. So, uh, we are there, we got a working R Studio um, setup uh, that you can access from your web browser, but is actually indeed running from a container um, on, uh, on my remote cloud instance on, on the POSI cloud. And it's a full working installation. So you, here you get everything that was installed by the Rocker guys in this Tidyverse image. Just to show you a very quick example, I think in the current directory that I launched the container from, there is a, here we go. There is a sample R script. So here they can go. Let's source this readings, readings, density. And it would even produce some nice outputs. Oh, yeah. So we just run a very quick and short data analysis with R from a graph. Web server from that runs from a container. 
and you can do a you can get a similar setup from uh, uh, for Jupyter notebooks. Uh, I don't have time to uh, walk you through that pathway during the webinar, but if you go back to the online materials that relate to this uh, tutorial, you will find a dedicated uh, session on how to achieve a similar result, Jupyter Notebooks for, for Jupyter fans. Um, okay, and I have one last uh, little tip for you today. Uh, because this, uh, this is almost the end of the story, we could get, we could get our studio to work. Let's see. let's close this up. Um, so let's just shut this this session from the command line. And um, apologies, I forgot to tell you the way I'm killing this session is simply by hitting Control C on, on my keyboard. There was an issue when I was running this setup on a shared system, such as uh, an HPC uh, system, and that's because when our studio runs it leaves some files behind on the temporary directory of the of the machine so slash pmp yeah these guys here our studio server and our studio session our session and unluckily this file this directory are not named they don't say that uh, it's the ubuntu user that created it so if this happens in a shared system you will, you will get conflicts and errors uh, whenever two people try to run this at the same time and in some occasions even one after the other uh so that's kind of a, of, a, of a problem and one way so let let me clean that up right now so that i show you a good workaround for this uh so now they're gone one way to avoid that uh from happening so that you can run this type of session eventually from a shared system is to add one more um flag to the singularity execution command, which is minus capital C. So this stands for contain all. So basically this flag raises the level of isolation of your container runtime in the machine. So now what happens basically now, we are not using anymore a number of system directories that are normally used by singularity for uh, say service <laughs> uh, purposes, such as creating temporary files. So you add this flag, TMP in the machine is not used anymore. Singularity uses other uh, dedicated locations and you can run the, say, the server uh, by multiple users uh, in a shell system. Uh, a byproduct of this is that uh, also the shell environment, so the variables become uh, isolated, which is why we actually defined user and password with the singularity syntax. Let me show you uh, this last aspect and then we're done. So now So now we are in, and I'm just, just getting out. Um, now if I kill again with Ctrl C and have a look at the content of PMP, there is no RStudio directory in there. So we're clean. Uh, we can run this type uh, of uh, setup in a shared system, and, and it would work. And let me go back to the slides. So the, the key points we touched on, so, the first one, I actually kind of <laughs> skipped it uh, just to save time. So if you are running this type of web service, uh, it means you're opening and using some communication port, this 8787 you saw in the setup. You, if you're running from a cloud instance, you need to ensure that that port is actually accessible because uh, you might have firewalls and rules that prevent that. So uh, if you uh, normally, the good thing is that any cloud uh, provider for scientific computing will have a protocol and a way to allow you to open these ports, but you need to do that. Otherwise, you won't even get to the welcome screen. If you run this on, on your local machine, it's, it's, uh, it's not a point at all. It, it's, uh, it's already sorted out. Uh, other things we did instead, and we kind of troubleshooted on the fly, was to take care of access credentials with user and password, uh, bind mount the home directory somehow to allow our studio to, to write its configuration files in there. And then isolate the container from the host for a tidier session, which doesn't leave uh, garbage when you when you close it. Um, and yeah, so this is we again in the interest of, of time we can't go to this now. But uh, there is a, there is an extra sec section in the online uh, tutorial materials that uh, discuss 
how you can uh, amend and modify this setup if you need the server to be running for a long time so that uh, when, you, when you shut your terminal, you don't, uh, you don't kill the server. And there is a dedicated uh, syntax in Singularity to achieve that. Um, I think that's it. Uh, the third uh, topic is, uh, is covered for me, so I'm happy to take any, any questions. Okay, so um, there is a question. How did you build the Docker image locally, but pull it from Docker daemon for converting to Singularity image? Yes, right. So, so yeah, you referred to this syntax I did before, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just a kind of uh, a trick. So you're not really, the build was local, as you, as you said, uh, but so the singularity pool can do different things. Uh, it can pool and download images, not only from uh, online locations, like web registries and so on, but also from locally. So, and you achieve the local uh, download by means of this, um, of this uh, syntax here. So Docker, Docker Daemon, I think that's here, it's a typo. Docker Daemon actually retrieves images from the local Docker installation. Um, and this can look a bit vague because I built the Docker image, but I never showed you where it went, right? So, um, it didn't go in the local directory, and that's because Docker, uh, Docker has its own path where it stores images. But the good thing is that there is a Docker syntax where you can see it needs Docker images that shows you the list of locally available images. And so this log cow today appeared. Uh, if I had run Docker images before the build, it would not have been here. So. Uh, you, you build your uh, images locally with Docker, and then you can always retrieve uh, the information on what images you have available locally with Docker images. And that's the information you ultimately use for Singularity Pool. So anything that is here, um, you can do the example in the other one that is already here, which is Ubuntu 18.04. You just need to remember to give a name. So anything that is in, this, uh, in the output of Docker images, you can pull it with Singularity Pool and Docker Daemon. And hopefully this uh, explanation kind of closes the loop. All right, thank you. I think um, there's other questions. Yeah. Uh, some good discussion going on, but I think we are coming up on the top of the hour. Right, so one last slide. So I mentioned it several times. Uh, we have online material that uh, cover the contents of this webinar, but even much more than that. So they are on this uh, on the first link here. Um, I'll try and remind today to send the link to Christina so she can share it with all of you. And the second link is just the GitHub repo that uh, basically uh, contains not only the, the HTML source codes of this tutorial, but also all of the input required to run the examples that we saw yesterday and today. And uh, today we covered the episodes five to seven of, the, of this tutorial and uh, the bonus uh, episode on uh, Jupyter Hub is number eight. Uh, I now leave the word to Anne. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Uh, thank you, Alexis, Audrey, and others for the great questions and discussion in the discussion board. Um, and thanks to Christina and the Australian Bio Commons for uh, collaborating on this webinar and this project. Um, and especially thank you to all of you for attending. There are some continuing questions coming in, so keep posting them and we'll be looking at the document, the discussion board and updating uh, for answers for that. Um, we also have another way you can get in touch with us. And that is through the Posi Hour, which is held um, every Monday from 10 to 11 o'clock. Uh, that's Western Standard Time, Australian Western Standard Time. It's a Posi Hour, ask me anything. It's a virtual open door. So you're all welcome. Um, you can register at posi.org.au backslash events. Uh, and if you haven't been to Posi, feel free to take a virtual tour. Thanks. And last word, thanks, you, thanks everyone for attending today. It's been a pleasure uh, hosting you. Thanks, Marco, for the great session. Now.
Thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you found it useful and we do appreciate you participating in the discussion board online as well. We'll spend another 10 or so minutes tidying up that um, Q&A that was happening there and that document will remain live um, forever for your future reference. We'll let you know when the recordings are online in the near future. And we hope you'll also come back and join us for tomorrow's session, that's scaling research with containers. You can register now for that on the BioCommons event webpage. Otherwise, I would just simply like to acknowledge that the Australian BioCommons and Pawsey Supercomputing Centre are enabled by NCRIS. And we'd also like to thank the Government of Western Australia and BioPlatforms Australia for their support. With that, I'll say goodbye and thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.